as always in this series, what I hope is that you will be surprised that what you know might shift or that you'll wonder what might happen to the ideas about history you already have if you spent more time here ferreting about in the collection. Because I think that's a particular challenge we face in thinking about the history of the First World War. There are so many versions of that story that we think we know. There are objects and even um, phrases that can se seem to stand in for the experience of a whole generation. We think we know what happened. But I know, looking at the material here that librarian Simon Farley has selected on these tables, that there are stories that you've never heard before. There are feminist medical hospitals treating the wounded in London with the woman doctor from Brisbane in it. And her recollections are sitting right over there. There's another woman who was beaten up for presenting a pacifist line at a public meeting not too far from here. There's a banned and destroyed copy of Hansard. Well, no, that's not true. It's the only extant copy that got away from Billy Hughes. And that's over there too. There are more stories of deaths from measles and typhoid and pneumonia than you might expect. There are thefts and desertions. There are tears and heartbreak and gallantry and an awful lot of compassion. And the work of Kate Walton, which we'll be hearing about tonight, is also widely unknown. It's terribly powerful, and I do hope that we'll be reading her book within the next year or so. Kate is completing her PhD at the University of Queensland very soon, and what I want to do is move back and forward between the big picture of commemoration and history and Kate's research. And so for that big picture, um, we're very honoured to have here tonight General Mark Evans, uh, Chair of the Queensland Advisory Committee of the Commemoration of the Anzac Centenary. And if you think that's a mouthful, just call it quack-ack. <laughs> um, Mark, can I ask you, how much do we need to retell that big picture story of World War I? Is it widely known enough? Well, I, I think the big picture is always important uh, to give you context on <coughs> the smaller stories and vice versa. Uh, so the big picture um, needs to be understood. Uh, the reason why you go to war needs to be understood. Um, uh, and then, then you get this disconnect between uh, the strategic why you go to war and the soldier or sailor uh, in the operating area who's fighting a battle really about their mates. Um, but yes, I think it is important to understand the big picture. But I think of more interest, you're drawn to the the, uh, the stories um, uh, of, of gallantry and uh, sacrifice. And perhaps I should actually go back to that, that bigger picture of the, um, the organisation that you're a part of, because in the next four years or so, we're going to keep revisiting World War I, aren't we? Mm. So can you actually explain what that committee is and what your role in it is? Well, um, we're a group of uh, people from... Uh, all parts of uh, Queensland life that have been drawn together by the minister assisting, uh, Minister Elms, to sort of provide some advice as to how Queensland uh, will commemorate this Anzac centenary. So between 2014 to 2018, how are we as Queenslanders going to recognise uh, that uh, great, well, what's called the Great War? Uh, and. Um, uh, we're quite a large committee, um, not not unwieldy by any means, but uh, it's been an interesting journey. We've met about three three times now, uh, and um, our focus has been on sort of establishing well what is important for us as Queenslanders, and of course there is the big picture, but really we've distilled it down to um, uh, commemorating in some way the ordinary. Queenslander. So we haven't focused on generals like me. Um, we've tried to focus more on the ordinary Queenslander. That's not necessarily the, the digger, um, but it's about the ordinary people that actually went and did extraordinary things. Uh, that probably in um, July of 1914 had no idea where they would be six months later. So uh, that's our key focus on the ordinary person and on the values that um, 
we feel were important that emerged from that conflict, in particular uh, courage, um, teamwork, sacrifice, integrity. Um, so those, that's the overarching uh, aspect. And then, then below that, we're looking at a series of uh, commemorative events of the, the activities that Queenslanders were involved in. Um, and a series of legacy projects. We, th we feel if we go through this Anzac centenary, recognising what people did in that, uh, that war, if we get out at the other end and leave nothing behind, uh, that would be a travesty. So we're looking to a series of uh, legacy projects of which uh, Queensland Museum and the Library uh, are going to be fundamental to that. <coughs> so it might not look in the traditional uh, uh, memorial project. Uh, we'll be leaning on or leveraging off technology and all kinds of things. But there will be something left at the end uh, that people can learn from. And the other, the other part that I'd like to mention at this point about what Quackack is doing is, you know, the, the theme that we we are we're placing great emphasis on is one of inclusiveness and an educative approach. So that it includes all Queenslanders and that it educates all Queenslanders. So do you find, as, as somebody who's both embedded in the military and who's now thinking so deeply about how we remember World War I, that you're still surprised that you hear stories you didn't know? Um, not only am I surprised I hear stories, but I'm, I've already been corrected by Simon today that I, one of the things I mentioned earlier was wrong, which is, <laughs> which is what you uh, uh, reminded us all, that we always learn about things. But, but essentially war is about uh, the human condition and uh, different people react to that in a different way. Uh, what I do know is that war is a tragedy uh, and should be avoided uh, uh, at all costs, well, not at all costs, but it, it needs to be uh, not taken lightly. So um, I actually like the theme of storytelling. Uh, you know, if you listen to uh, soldiers or even people on the home front, they have a story to tell, and I think it's really important that we sort of make sure that we capture this. And that's another part of this Anzac centenary, that, that we capture because the living memory is almost gone and it's important that we, we make sure that doesn't get lost, um, you know, by 2018. Well, one of the things that I confess surprised me in thinking about whose stories get told, which stories are repeated and so on, and I'll confess that I didn't know that there were soldiers who were captured, some actually at Gallipoli, by the Turks. Mm -hmm. So they became prisoners of war. Now, Kate, this is the area of your expertise. Can you tell us why you think that story is so little known? Um, yes. <laughs> I think that in the, the immediate context of the time, um, we're talking about 200 Australians taken prisoner by the Turks. So, so two, only 200? Only 200 or 204. Um, out of the whole cohort of the AIF, the, the Navy, the, the Flying Corps. So 200 men is not very much anyway. But when you compare that against the 150,000 wounded and the 60,000 that never came home, um, I think it's quite easy to understand why that experience was initially overlooked. Um, and then I think as time went on and you, we, we get into World War II and we have 22,000 Australians taken prisoner by the Japanese and another 8,000 taken prisoner by the Germans. Then again, it gets overlooked. Um, and then there's the sense of, I think, taking being taken prisoner was something that wasn't really part of the, the you know the Australian expectation of, of what their soldiers or how their soldiers should be acting or, or there's like an expectation that they didn't quite meet. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Because I, I think that's a really important mm. idea to get across. Because if I understand from what I've read of your work, it seems that that experience didn't fit mm. with the image that Australia had of itself mm. during World War One. Mm -hmm. um, well, the Anzac ideal or the Anzac mythology is, is not... I mean, it has its roots in colonial Australia, really, with the idea of the bushmen 
um, the kind of frontiersman and all the qualities that he embodied. So that was courage, um, mateship, um, sacrifice, never giving up, ba um, battling against the odds, all those kinds of values. And I think when that got transferred into to what the Anzacs were supposed to uphold or supposed to embody, that idea that, that these men were taken prisoners, so they surrendered or they were captured. So it kind of brought into question, I guess, their sense of of um, never giving up. And I think if you read some of the, the letters that Maurice Delprat wrote to his family, who was one of the Australians captured on Gallipoli, um, he he felt it very keenly that he'd let, let the side down. Um, and he continued to feel that for the entire time he was in captivity and for a lot of the time when he came home as well. And those papers are, are just over there and indeed quite a, a large number of the family, yeah. the Del Pratt family, are, are here tonight. So we might even hear from them about the importance of these papers. But one of the things that you find looking at those letters is it also uncovers another part of the history that, that we'll mm. talk about and that's the role of volunteers. Mm. So there are crucial people in the Red Cross who helped mm. keep that story and that communication going, wasn't there? Absolutely. Um, there was, uh, not until October 1916, was there any kind of um, organisation dedicated to the welfare of Australian prisoners of war. Uh, and when that organisation opened up, it was based in London and it was staffed completely by volunteers. It was headed by um, a lady called Elizabeth Chomley, who was an Australian living in London at the time. Um, and without those women working in that department, those prisoners of war would have been far, far worse off because these, these ladies um, communicated with them. They organised food parcels for them, comforts parcels for them, sent them off to Turkey. They wrote to their families back home in Australia to keep the communication alive between the different people in the different parts of the world. Um, yeah, I don't think you can really underestimate how important Chomley and her team were for these prisoners of war. So, Mark, how do you imagine incorporating those sorts of stories? So, in a way, we immediately think of the front line and mm. the soldiers, but there are all these other networks, aren't there, that, that are part of the experience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think um, the, the Anzac bit uh, is but one part of the story. And I think uh, over this next four or five years, what we have to do is draw all those threads together in a coherent way, uh, if we can. I mean, it's a big ask <coughs> because there are so many threads. <coughs> um, but all of those, um, and I guess how we're trying to do it here in Queensland is trying to recognise all the elements of what Queenslanders did during the war. You know, there's a bigger picture in terms of... Uh, uh, the Commonwealth or the, the federal approach to uh, um, the Anzac centenary, but, but, but our focus is really uh, trying to be on Queenslanders and what they did, and that could be um, from Queensland Rail, we talked about uh, this afternoon, uh, through to uh, women at war in different, uh, different guises, such as the Red Cross. Um, so I, I guess we are really going to be um, restricted by our imagination here. Uh, because there are so many elements of war and it wasn't all glorious either. There will be some stories, I'm sure, that you are will... Are uncomfortable. Yes, mm. I'm sure there will be. And, uh, uh, you know, we're already hearing one, one uncomfortable story, but it's the reality. And war, war is, is full of uh, these uncomfortable things. Well, one other aspect, just thinking about the, the Queensland perspective for the history of World War One. Queensland has a very long and fine tradition, as we know, of annoying the Commonwealth Government. Mm. And, um, and they were certainly doing it in World War I. I mean, it was the only state that had an anti-conscription line. And I, and I mentioned the, um, the wonderful Hansard that, um, that Billy Hughes tried to destroy. And the only reason there's a copy here is because the censor, whose job it was to go and seize the um, Hansard and destroy it, kept a copy for himself, mm. which is... Historians love things like that. Um, so in terms of the Queensland story, how do you approach something like that conscription debate, which was fought and debated on the battlefield just as much as yeah. it was at home, wasn't it? Indeed it was. I mean, um, when we were talking earlier, uh, you know, a very, very strong um, feeling from the AIF that they didn't want conscription. And um, 
You know, their contribution was, well, we don't want this. Probably because they'd experienced it mm. and they didn't want anybody else to probably have to uh, go through um, this, their experience. So um, I, I think all those things will be brought out. I, I know that uh, Queensland Libraries, I know that the, the museum, uh, they're all focusing on, on these issues and they will come out and they're, they're, they're fascinating issues. And were you familiar with that story of the, the Hansard and Billy Hughes? Um, and I was through uh, Queensland Rail because um, uh, I think they still got the carriage in which um, he, mm. he <laughs> travelled around the country in. So, yes, I, I was aware of that, but, but not about the Hansard. Oh. And I probably can't do the story justice, but, um, but in the, the white glove section, you really must have a look at that and see just how... Um, Oh, just how full on the debate mm. was in mm. Parliament, which um, they, they tried to suppress. But I guess that also brings us to the question of censorship, which is a whole part of the war experience as well. And censorship is something that every historian has to deal with in looking at the period, because you almost have to read around the mm. censorship and sometimes physically reading through things that have been blacked out. Mm. So did you have to deal with that? Letters home from the POWs? Yes, um, the Turks would physically censor uh, ingoing and outgoing mail. Um, so sometimes you're flicking through archives or flick, uh, flicking through folders and you'll find a, a letter and you think, oh, great, this is fantastic, and then there's a big bit chopped out and you have to think, oh, OK, I'm not quite sure what was going on. Obviously, the Turks didn't want people to know about that. But there's also that element of um, self-censorship that you get in a lot of letters home from the front line and also a lot of letters home from prisoner of war camps. So um, I've, had, I've had letters, I've seen letters from POWs to the official correspondents, so the Red Cross inquiring after their health and the, the prisoner has said, I've had dysentery a few times, I've had malaria multiple times, I'm not getting enough food, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been working too hard, I've had smallpox. But then in the letters home, they're writing, oh, I'm fine, don't worry about me. Um, everything's great, you know, chin up. Um, so you've really got to, that's, I guess, why it's so important to corroborate your source material as well to get the full picture. Um, but yeah, self-censorship can be tricky. But also it's a very powerful thing, isn't it? Reading letters back and forward and that question of who's writing, what stories they're yes. telling. I mean, yeah. the Eleanor Bourne papers that are over there on the table, Eleanor Bourne was the, the doctor from Brisbane who then went and worked in um, the Endor Street hospital, which was a feminist-run hospital. So her papers are there, but the papers of her brother are here in the John mm. Oxley Library as well. And he writes very different things to mm. his sister, who was a doctor. He writes a lot from the Middle East about um, medical conditions, mm. about people dying of mm -hmm. um, diphtheria and so on. He writes about very different things to his parents. And mm. so reading through his papers, it's mm. a very powerful experience. Yeah, I, I think it's almost... Like they're, they're two people engaging in a bit of a performance. It's a bit of a charade because they must know that, that their prisoner is not fine and they must know at home, the prisoner must know at home that the family's worried. But it's almost like this, um, nobody really wants to, to kind of talk about it. It's all dancing around the topic and, and yeah, that self-censorship. In, in fact, it's interesting. Um, uh, I think I was the last generation of people that wrote letters Mm. Um, uh, the modern uh, soldier doesn't write letters anymore. Mm. I, I sort of wonder how we're going <coughs> to capture this, mm, uh, this history later on. Mm. But can you talk a bit, um, Mark, about the importance of personal papers and diaries and letters and so on? I mean, there's such an immediate way into that story of World War One. Well, uh, I guess the first response to that is you're not supposed to really write diaries or uh, <laughs> and letters have to be censored, but they where there's a will, there's a way. But I think they're immensely... I mm. mean, uh, just uh, looking over there at a, a little diary uh, that a soldier had written, and I, d I don't think you can ever get a sense... You can hear somebody, you know, talk about it second-hand. But to really understand it, you've got to get that person to I really tell you or it be shown in the letters. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I agree, letters can can actually be written and can hide things. Um, but there are a lot of letters which are very telling mm. um, and, um, you know, that brings out the horrors of war. Mm. 
but I think it's a very important part of our history that we've, mm. got to, we've got to make sure that we capture. Well, and a lot of the letters and diaries over there weren't supposed to be written either. Mm. And there'll often be a comment on that. So one whole sort of genre of letters from World War I are of soldiers writing home to um, the, the family of one of their comrades mm. who died. Mm. And they say, I want to tell, tell you what happened. But by the way, don't let anybody know that I've sent you this because they give more detail, sometimes quite graphic detail, mm. actually, about what happened. Mm. Um, but it seems that some people were allowed to keep diaries. So the Reverend Green, who was with one of the light horse, um, you can actually, I was a bit confused at first. I was looking at his diary and there seemed to be pages that were sort of perforated. And then mm. I realised when I turned to the back and there was some, it was still intact, that he was writing on some sort of carbon. So mm. it was, I guess, a sort of semi-official or an official diary mm. and it's actually over there opened at the page where he reports on the death of Simpson as in the man with the donkey mm. um, and so that certainly is is worth looking at. Mm. Um, can you explain, I mean you mentioned the Del Pratt collection of letters so what's in that collection of personal papers because I know there are a lot of people <laughs> here who might have done that sort of original research mm -hmm. but for people who've never gone through mm. a collection What's it like going through these, this collection of papers? Oh, it's fascinating. I mean, there's about four years of correspondence between Morris and his um, sister back home. There's a few letters that she sent to him. There's a few uh, Red Cross receipts. Um, this is what I love when we're talking about the importance of the physical letter, is that it's that, uh, that material culture and holding on to those actual little pieces of paper that these people wrote on. And there's actually a quite a funny letter that Morris wrote when he got caught in a rainstorm and he's writing, I've been caught in a rainstorm, um, the ink's all going to get smudged. And you can see where the, the rain, the water's actually hit the paper and smudged the ink and it just gives you so much more of a vivid idea of, of not just the story he's telling but where he was at the time, um, the kind of, you know, seeing the mud on the paper, seeing the, um, the actual tangible evidence of, of where he was and what he was doing. Um, but those, that collection in particular is, is um, fascinating, yeah. well worth a look. <laughs> well, and part of that collection too comes, I mean, even though it's held here at the John Oxley Library, actually comes from the Australian War Memorial. Mm. And that's some of the official correspondence mm. that in the context, having read some of your papers on it and, and read some of the other letters, is heartbreaking because it's the official um, repatriation mm. documents and they're sort of testing out his experience, trying to see if it's really true or not. Mm. Um, and that's part of the story too, isn't it, Mark? What happened after people returned? Yeah. Mm. Well, of course, uh, we're looking at that now with the, the recent um, wars. Um, you know, it doesn't end at the end of the war. Uh, the story goes on. Uh, and for, fortunately, we're sort of focusing on a 2014 to 2018, but the story is much longer than that and covers uh, people's repatriation, uh, how people man manage their injuries, um, how people came back into the workforce. Um, and uh, they're, they're the same things that we're, we're dealing with at the moment with our current uh, forces coming back. Except I believe currently we tend to believe what they did. <laughs> Whereas, Kate, what, what happened to these men who had been prisoners of war? Their, their experience was doubted in a way. Um, yes. Well. When they came back from Turkey, they either went through Egypt or straight to London, through Europe to London. Um, and what the War Memorial, the War Records section, as it was then, before it became the War Memorial, uh, wanted was a statement from each prisoner um, explaining basically the circumstances of their capture. So how, where, where they'd been, um, who they'd been with, the officers who were in charge, if they weren't an officer themselves. Um, and I think it's quite interesting when you go through the administrative records of people like um, uh, John Trelaw, who was head of the war records section and then later went on to uh, be the first director of the War Memorial. Um, when they're asking for information from these men, they're asking specifically for those circumstances of capture. So the actual experiences of captivity didn't rate so highly on the, the war records section um, list of priorities but it is you do definitely get the sense that they were testing them to make sure that they'd been captured legitimately I guess and not kind of defected. <laughs> how much for the the sort of work and research you do how much is it a story of 
the experience of the prisoners of war mm. in their camps? And how much does it become a story of the home front, of the family left behind? Well, that's that's something I've tried very hard to to maintain throughout my thesis, is I definitely did not want it to be a story of the men in the camps because the work that that historians have done for, on World War II prisoners of war and uh, Vietnam, veter uh, Vietnam prisoners of war in America um, shows that, that captivity experience does not just affect the captive. It has knock-on effects for those at home and it also has effects when they come home. Um, so I didn't want it to be just a story of captivity. So, um, yeah, the work of the Red Cross features quite heavily. Um, the the feelings or, or how the families who were left behind felt about it and I guess coped with this really peculiar absence because you know their husband or their son or their brother wasn't um, on some field in France he was in the middle of Turkey and you know Australians at that time didn't know much they weren't very good on clear on <laughs> no. where it was were they no they didn't really know where it was um, there's actually some very quite powerful letters written from mothers to the Red Cross saying can somebody please come and show me where um, Hajikiri or where Afyon Karahisar, these big internment centres in Turkey, can someone come and show me where it is on a map because I can't find it myself and I want to know where my son is. Which is terribly poignant. It is. It? <laughs> Mark, in terms of thinking of, again, the next four years, how important is it that we think about the home front, what was happening in Queensland in World War One? Well, um you know, as we've we've already sort of talked around it, it's immensely important because it's all part of the whole. Um, there were people that actually went to war, um, but there are equally people came uh, or were in Queensland <coughs> supporting those activities and and having to get on with their lives to a certain extent. I mean, I think most people were influenced, um, changed by the war, uh, because most people had a son or a brother or a father at war. So nobody nobody was removed from that. Uh, but there were, I guess, changes. It, it changed our society in many ways. You know, men weren't there mm. to do some of the jobs that were traditionally men's jobs. So women were having to work uh, in armaments or on the land or different places, you know. Um, and uh, women in families had to take up a bigger role, I guess. Well, not a bigger role, but a changed role. Mm. Um, so I think you can't separate the two. There mm. was the, the war front, as I say to my wife, I'm, I'm war front and you're home front. Um, <laughs> and we're inextricably linked. Mm. And one of the shorthand ways, I guess, of accessing that story, if we're again thinking about the collection here in the John Oxley, is through the visual record. And that's a very powerful one mm. because often the images show patriotic floats and mm. bizarre dress-ups as Lady Britannia and all sorts mm. of things like that, um, fairs. And then you also are seeing people just going about their everyday life. Mm. I mean, do you find visual material a part of a useful part of your research? Are there, are I, there many visual records? Uh, there are a few. Um, I've got a... a the, the Courier, or the Brisbane Courier, as it was then, had a weekend supplement called the Queenslander. You might know about it. And sometimes they brought out pictorial um, versions of that. And I've got a, quite an interesting photograph of a group of young um, Australians, young Queenslanders, dressed up. The girls are always dressed up as Red Cross nurses. And the boys are always dressed up as uh, little soldiers. But they're out there raising funds specifically for the prisoners of war. So that's quite a poignant photograph as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of the images, am I right, Simon, is it all of the images in the Queenslander that show um, World War One soldiers have been documented? No, well, the Queenslanders are digitised. So the Queenslanders are completely digitised. So if anybody here is doing research into their own family history from World War One, they should be able to track down, you know, whether there are pictures of their, um, their family. And, and the, the visual records here are you know are mm. huge mm. um what i find what i find amazing about um those photographs i look at them uh, and i think he looks just like sergeant smith who mm. i've worked with or you know lieutenant S smith um there is absolutely no difference between that person in 1917 and the young person that could go to war uh, today they're the same people mm. 
um, the difference is the leadership and uh, you know how much uh, equipment they have and, and that, but they're fundamentally the same people that have to go to war. Uh, and we have to think closely about you know, uh, embarking on such things. And one of the differences, I guess, is, is what could happen to their bodies in that um, death by, by disease in World War I was still a huge issue. I think less so than wars before that. Mm. Um, but I think the medical history of World War I is a hugely interesting one mm. and one that if anybody wants to do more work, I think that's an area that yeah. we need more research mm. on. Mm. And um, so is that the... Uh, I'm not quite sure where I want to go with that. <laughs> um, actually, just in terms of, you know, illness and, and so on, what happened to these... Um, prisoners, of prisoners of war. What were the actual conditions like? Well, basically the prisoners of war were treated on the same footing as a Turkish soldier would have been treated, um, which a lot of them were very unhappy about because they felt that the standard of living in Turkey was much lower than it was in Australia, and that's um, a fair call. It was a lot lower. Um, the Ottoman Empire, as it was, was crumbling. Um, it was bankrupt. It had been at war in the Balkans for years and years and years before the First World War even broke out. Um, standards of healthcare across the entire empire were very, very low. Uh, there wasn't enough hospital beds for everybody. Um, diseases like typhoid, uh, malaria, sometimes cholera, uh, dysentery were pretty much endemic throughout most of Turkey. Um, and a lot of the men, because they um, were, a lot of the enlisted men were working on quite physically demanding um, labor projects um, they just I they were just quite susceptible to disease I guess and, and they weren't getting full rations either um, so you factor in I guess malnutrition um, so disease was a big problem for the prisoners of war in Turkey and it accounted for a lot, about 25 percent of them and so how did they cope I mean one of the things that you explore in your research is is humor humor and resilience <laughs> humor yeah Yes. Um, well, I think that can only go so far, really. There's only so much you can really laugh about. Um, they, tried to, they tried to implement um, practical ways t of coping, I guess. So ways of improving their standards of living, um, ways of improving their standards of health care. So about 19, the end of 1916, um, the British medical officers that had been captured um, kind of came in and took over all POW health care, uh, which was be very beneficial to the prisoners. Um, yeah, I think humour, humour, I think there's only so much you can laugh at, really, and the, they needed to be practical. But that does, I guess, say something about how looking at the, the history of World War One. there are times when it's uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, even looking at the newspapers of the time, there can be, um, you know, whether they're cartoons, whether they're jokes, things that make us a little uncomfortable. Mm. It tells us something about a very different time. Yeah. How do we deal with the uncomfortable histories of World War One? do you think? Well, I think, I think you have to be open about them because they're part of it. I mean, war is uh, an imperfect thing. Uh, a lot of the things that occur, I mean, there are wonderful things that occur in war. Um, wonderful sacrifice, great courage, they're all wonderful things, but there's, there is the dark side, I suppose, um, where, you know, people fail and people uh, don't m measure up to their own standards or, or the standards that others would impose on them. Uh, I guess that has to come out, but it, I mean, we placed people under tremendous pressure in that war. That was, uh, I mean, that was uh, an amazing thing that we asked people to do, and it, uh, it um, surprises me that um, we we were, and I think still are, very resilient. And that's that's the issue: is that um, underpinning all of your black humour and all of those things is a resilience and that ability to keep going on. Mm -hmm. And it probably wasn't keep going on for God and country, or king and country, it was because of that person who came from the same village in Queensland as you did, and you are not going to let him down. Mm 
um, and uh, I think but some people didn't measure up in their own minds as you mentioned you know people felt they failed when they got captured but um, that's part of the story and I think that has to we have to expose that part of the story I suppose and one of the things that I think that that also refers to is the way that as a researcher you can be hit by the emotion in the archive mm. and it can be quite shocking and quite powerful you can be going through something quite dispassionately and then something can shock you or move you um, and you know all of these boxes there's blood and sweat and tears on them I mean do you find that research an emotional experience does it just come and hit you in the yes. face sometimes yes I often get um criticised by my supervisor for putting in too much emotion. <laughs> this is supposed to be very dispassionate. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I mean, I remember being in the War Memorial in Canberra and going through um, one particular prisoner's file. It started in 1915 and he got all the way to 1918. And then the last letter in the file was a letter uh, from one of the other prisoners to this original prisoner's sister saying, I'm sorry, but your brother's died of Spanish flu. And just to, to have read three years of correspondence from this, this man to his loved ones at home and, and from the loved ones at home back to the man and his hopes and his expectations and him thinking about his life after the war and them thinking about having him home after the war and then to just find that very last letter, it's, it's heartbreaking, yeah. And that happened to an awful lot of them. I mean, I think there was a whole boatload that sat in quarantine they weren't mm. allowed down the river and they were there mm. at the quarantine station because, you know, the, the flu had broken out and mm. they, they weren't mm. going to be able to land. Mm. And so the, the archives are still powerful. Mm. I mean, we can still be moved by them. I mean, I felt myself getting a little bit teary as I was looking at some <laughs> of those, you know, material over there that you'll have a chance to look at. And I should also say before I forget, there's a handout with the resources. Um, there's a whole pile of them over there. Um, of the, the resources that are here at the library, the other research you can do, the way that you might like to be surprised yourself. But in preparing for this, um, this night, um, I've been working with um, Simon Farley, the librarian here at the John Oxley. And just last week, and this is, I think, a great example of being surprised in the archive, he said, have a look at this. And it was an envelope with a strange sort of dark shadow that you could see through the envelope. Um, it had a small piece of the fusillars from the Red Baron's plane. <laughs> and it's on the table, I think. Um, but before you go and have a look at the material there, I know that there are people um, who have a personal stake in the material here in the archives, but there may also be people who just want to ask questions of our panellists. Now, we do have some radio mics, and just because there's quite a lot of people, if you wouldn't mind waiting um, so that we can hear your question or your comment, I know I'd be quite interested to hear from some members of the Del Pratt family if they want to talk about <laughs> their collection and what it means to have a personal collection like that, but there may be other questions or comments uh, that people would like to make. Oh, please don't be too shy. <laughs> um, I haven't thought this out very clearly, but um, you, you mentioned the um, conscription and the um, strong opposition to conscription here in Queensland. And it seems to me there's sort of a disconnect perhaps between this and the vilification of people who for one reason or another didn't go to the war. Mm. And it reminded me not of Queenslander, but one of the people who was vilified was Robert Menzies because his family decided he'd be the one who would not go. And, um, and we think there's a robust you know, criticism and nasty things said about politicians today, but the things that were said <laughs> about him over decades mm. were just, if not, if, if not more so. So I wondered if there are anything emerging in Queensland that helps, or, or what stories there might be in Queensland of people who suffered as a result of their conscientious objection to the war and, um, well, and how that connects up with this opposition to conscription. Mm. So you don't want people to be conscripted but then there was severe criticism of people who, who didn't go and who were thought um, to have been such as they should have gone. I guess that's a paradox uh, <laughs> we deal with. Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I'm sure in repatriation, uh, sorry, uh, recruiting and, um, uh, and embarkation uh, is one of the themes, and I think 
that particular issue will come out uh, in who went and who mm. didn't go and why didn't they go. Mm. A lot of people didn't go because that, you know, somebody had to stay on the farm and keep mm. the farm going. There was, so there was good reasons why a lot of men uh, didn't go, I suppose. Like, but mm. certainly there, there were also political groups who were mm. actively opposed to the whole practice of an imperial war. Mm. And, um, and over on the um, table over there is the story of one woman, the one I mentioned at the beginning, who was a Quaker um, and who, was, who actively spoke out against the war. And mm. she was thrown out of public meetings. Um, she was beaten up by other women. Mm. She had a very, very tough time of it. Mm. And her papers, I believe, aren't held here in the John Oxley. They're held in another institution in Queensland. But I'm sure there are traces of those movements mm. um, here in, in the library mm. as well. And again, it's a sort of uneasy part of the story, but an important one. I think in the end it's not an easy, easy part of the story because what it actually shows is that we were a democracy uh, and people were did have their views uh, and the, the men that were at the front fighting themselves said, no, we don't want conscription. Um, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful part of the story that actually, you know, they saw the horrors of war, they understood what it was about, they were prepared to continue and do their bit but they didn't see a reason why others had to, mm. why it had to be compulsory. And I think, well, we were one of the few nations that didn't mm. have conscription mm. uh, during that war. I think I'm right in saying. Yeah. And I think that, well, we were a democracy, and that's a great thing. And there's one subplot of the conscription <laughs> story which many people will be familiar with, and that's the, um, the way in which it was partly divided on sectarian Mm. lines. And I was reading some papers oh, yeah. um, last week from a, a soldier who wrote a letter home that's terribly, I mean, it's, it's sort of amusing to read now because he's describing his best friend um, at the front who was really important for his sort of survival, mm. really. Um, he said, and you, you wouldn't believe it, um, he's a Roman Catholic and then he sort of has an aside to his family, you know, but really, but he is my best friend here. And, his, <laughs> and it sort of went on from that, and he kept on referring to the ways in which this wasn't somebody he would have been best friends with no. at home. Mm. It was a whole Irish question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, right. mm. that yes, it is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask Kate about the issue of corroboration that you were talking about. And um, what other, I mean, besides all the official records, what is the best way to corroborate the stuff that comes through in personal letters, which, as you say, is quite um, protective of the family at home? Mm. Are, there any, are there any good sources of, uh, you know, other corroboration? For the prisoners? Or yeah. 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 Um, definitely the Red Cross files. I think I was... Uh, t talking to you about that before. Um, every prisoner of war, when he, when he was confirmed, well, first of all, when he went missing, he um, would have a wounded and missing file with the Wounded and Missing Bureau of the Red Cross. When he was confirmed as a prisoner of war, that file then closed and he had a prisoner of war department file, which was another branch of the Red Cross, which is the one that Elizabeth Chomley headed up in London. And those files um, are all held in the memorial in Canberra, but they're fascinating insights because like I said you get a completely different take on the man's health um, on his feelings about um, you know what's going on the way that they wrote to Chomley and her team was very different from the way they wrote to their to their parents or to their sisters at home so that's definitely a good one the other one that I've used a lot in my research is the uh, repatriation department case files so when a man came home or I should say when a, when a woman came home as well when a nurse came home they were eligible for um, benefits um, through the repatriation department so that was uh, financial assistance um, help with getting a job or getting back into the workforce uh, medical care and you find a lot of really interesting information in those files as well because again it's a very different take on the situation so definitely the Red Cross files and the repatriation files. And some of those files, I believe, are about to become easier to access because there's a project underway with the um, National Archives, which, um, sorry to put you on the spot, but I know that there's a <laughs> National Archives right here, 
um, and that would be useful, I think, for researchers. Well. Um, yeah, I'm Greg Cope. I'm from the National yeah. Archives. We are looking at a project for next year to digitise repatriation mm. files for about the first 2,000 soldiers mm. that returned from World War I. Mm. So um, that's under the... Um, the scoping is underway at the moment. Mm. So we've got um, uh, many miles of repatriation files yeah. in the archives <laughs> and they're actually not permanent records. They're actually still regarded as temporary records. Um, but World War I um, repatriation files are fully open to the public. Mm. Uh, so anyone can access them. Mm. But we are hoping we, we will be able to digitise. Mm. Uh, but people can get them digitised mm. as well. Anyway, thanks for mentioning that. But what about other files, though? I mean, not just repatriation files, but if people want to track um, a, a relative. I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff available online, isn't there? Uh, yeah, all the World War One service dossiers have all been digitised. So they equal about... Uh, 390,000 files mm. and they're all online through the National Archives website. So if you th know the name of the soldier, you can do a search for a World War One file and it's been digitised and you can view that online. Uh, World War Two files, there's almost a million uh, World War Two service files and they're digitised on demand. Mm. Uh, quite a lot of them are digitised and can be viewed online and if you do find a file... Uh, you can get them digitised, a World War II file. And we do now have uh, Korean service <laughs> uh, files as well and people can get them digitised as well. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Kate, I was wondering if there, for your work there were any Turkish sources that you used? Yes. Um, I have a few. Um, I have a few contacts in Turkey who have been very generous in helping me out. Um, I have a f um, all the interrogation reports that the Turks did when they captured a man um, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Britain, from France. Um, I have all the Australian, the ones that are, you know, regarding the Australian prisoners. Um, Turkish sources are very hard to come by, though, because obviously they were written in Ottoman. Um, and... I don't know how open they are to people kind of just fronting up to the archives and asking for a, a big stack of files. So, and I, I mean, they are an important part of the story, but for me, I wanted to, to talk about the Australian experience and how the Australians involved felt about what was happening. And not, so not just what happened to them, I guess, but felt how they felt about what was happening, how they coped with what was happening. And because a lot of my work is um, home front based and a lot of my work is um, after the war as well, I didn't really feel that the Turkish sources that I needed to get so deep into that. Um, but I'm sure there's some out there <laughs> for some intrepid <laughs> scholar. And sorry, there's a question at the front here. Oh, Mark, I was going to direct it to you, if you don't mind. Um, you were talking about previously, uh, talking about the darker aspects of the First World War, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate a little bit more on um, the AWOL part of mm. soldiers mm. going uh, missing in action sort of thing and then coming back and obviously forfeiting pay um. and all of that, how much that played a part in, in, in the war. And as well, um, some men didn't return until late in 1919. What was the reason for them staying on well after the war ended? Um, well, to answer the last bit first, I think possibly part of that re reason is the actual mechanics mm. of getting people back. Mm. Um, uh, that that in, in itself is probably a, a big story, um, mm. and of course, once a war is finished, you have to try and demobilise as quickly as, from a government perspective, demobilise as quickly as possible and get people back mm. into the workforce. So I would imagine, although I don't know completely, yeah, yeah. that a part of it is about the mechanics of it. Um, if I can turn to um, uh, the issues of AWOL and the darker side as um, I suppose uh, in every war there are things that are, uh, occur that shouldn't occur. Um, uh, the Australians were um, a highly disciplined force, uh, very effective in what they did. Um, you know, uh, British generals always spoke about the Australians as, as a wonderful uh, capability and were used actually... Uh, to plug the gaps or fix the problem in many instances. 
Um, that doesn't mean to say that there weren't people that went AWOL. Uh, there were. Um, uh, there were probably people uh, shot that shouldn't have been shot, you know, in terms of uh, attacking a position and should people have been taken prisoners or should they, or what should have happened? Well, I'm sure that uh, there were instances where, you know, people were shot. Mm. Um, I'm sure those things happened. Uh, obviously, there was not the media that there is today that covers those things. But, but by and large, um, uh, I would say the Australians um, uh, were one of the finest organisations that fought in, in France and in Flanders. Um, uh, but there is always that part which, mm. you know, um, not that you would want to bury it. And this is the point that was made earlier. I think all these things have to come out because you have to accept what war is about. Yeah. And it's not a pretty thing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, men react in different ways when they're under pressure. Uh, and in the end, some of those fights were really bitter struggles. Uh, a lot of men got killed. You know, I mean, uh, today, uh, we would be, I don't know that we would be able to cope with the level of casualties that, that they experienced. Um, it was horrific. What, uh, they say, uh, I don't know the um, statistics exactly, but uh, at the men in gate in Flanders, if you put uh, all the men uh, that were killed um, from the Commonwealth, uh, in a row, it would take them three days in a column to march through the Menin Gate. If you can imagine that, a continuous march through. I think it's three days or it could be four, but it's a huge amount of people. The demographics of Australia changed because of what happened. I mean, it was tremendous. And that was the thing that I admire um, about them, and I like to think that we still have and I mentioned it earlier, is that resilience, that toughness to, you know, endure. Mm. Um, and they certainly had that in bags. Yeah. I, I would just add that um, a lot of the incidences of AWOL that I've come across are not soldiers going AWOL from the front. They're soldiers going AWOL from um, training camps, um, from big cities where they're, where they're waiting to go into action. Um, and I think that you can quite easily... I mean, a lot of other historians have done a lot of work on this, people like Peter Stanley. Um, but I think it's quite... When you, when you think about this big group of men waiting to go into action, they're all relatively young. A lot of them would never have left Australia before. They're in these big, exciting places like Cairo or London. It'd be quite easy for them to just slip away for a few hours or a few extra hours or a few days or whatever and then kind of sneak their way back in. And if they're caught, then they're caught. They forfeit a few days' pay. They might have to, to get locked up for a few days. But, you know, the risk is worth it when you can you know, be going out and having a bit of fun. I think, I think we just need to remember that they were just ordinary men in an extraordinary situation when the opportunity presented itself. I was reading the papers of somebody else um, just over there and, um, and there seemed to be an awful lot of that that happened on their way through South Africa. Mm. So in Durban, there was an awful lot of Australians disappearing to the point where they then didn't let them off the ship at all, which yeah. <laughs> annoyed the next lot absolutely mightily. Yes. Um, now, there's a question um, over the back there. I was just going to ask Kate, um, you were talking about censorship and I'm just wondering... Um, you know, Sydney Locke's banned, banned account mm. of um, Gallipoli. Did that get much currency before it was suppressed? And what was the reaction of other serving men to that coming out in such a strong way? Oh, I couldn't tell you about about the reaction to Locke's account, but I know that um, the, the first accounts of the landings, for example, written by um, Ellis Ashmead Barlett and Charles Bean, um, circulated prolifically in the newspapers at home um, and amongst the troops on Gallipoli as well. And then I guess those ideas took root and then we have the publication of the Anzac book in um, late 1915, early 1916. It was meant to be a um, commemorative book to celebrate Christmas and New Year um, on Gallipoli, but the evacuation meant that it kind of changed a little bit and it became more of a um, history written by the men, for the men, when 
I mean, in actual fact, a lot of it was written by Charles Bean and it's very um, heavily edited by Bean. And, and, um, but I think those ideas, um, Locke's account and Keith Murdoch's letter as well, um, quite suppressed in favour of Bartlett and Bean's um, ideas and, and images of Gallipoli and what was happening. And they're the ones that took currency with the troops. That's and I guess the other thing that that gets back to is the way in which World War One has been so important to our sort of national <coughs> imagination and identity. And one of the things that I found striking about um, reading your work was the way in which you say that the POW experience doesn't fit that, both because they often identified as imperial troops rather than Australian troops, but also because it didn't it didn't fit with the heroic ideal that was being used at the time. Mm. Yeah, um, like I said earlier on, that those ideals that the Anzacs were um, supposed to embody, so things like uh, bravery, courage, never giving up, never surrender kind of thing, um, their ideals that you see back in the colonial period, uh, frontier men um, trying to settle the land and, and that kind of thing. And they were so deeply ingrained in the Australian psyche um, that that is what the Australian male should be, you know, the, these ideas of, of Australian masculinity. And for the men to... Uh, for the prisoners to um, surrender or to give in, you know, in, in those circumstances, it... It did um, affect them, but it also, I think, didn't give them much coverage at home. They didn't get much coverage at home because they weren't fighting. Do you know what Whereas I mean? Whereas by World War Two, it was recognised as part of the war experience. Mm. Well, there was just so mm. many more of them that it was too... It, you just couldn't ignore it. You know, you're talking about nearly 30,000 Australians taken prisoner during that war. So it's a, it's probably the, the Japanese POW camps, I'd say, is the defining experience of a lot of Australians in the Pacific, aside from Kokoda. Um, and it's just so um, so much a part of that, that story of World War II compared to World War I. Now, I think the, the expertise of, of both our guests uh, might be something that we could exploit in an informal way as we move around the um, original materials over there. Um, and there are also, of course, various members of staff from the State Library. And in fact, there's a room full of expertise here of people from various other archives as well. Um, so perhaps you could join me in, in thanking our guests, Mark Evans and Kate Walton. <laughs> And please do grab a copy of the uh, World War I resources list and feel free to have a look at the material. There's um, some really extraordinary stuff there. So thank you very much.